Welcome to the show, Chuck Shoot Podcast. Very excited. Today I have a great guest, uh, Ugly Kid Joe guitarist Dave Fortman. I mean, this was like a real treat for me because uh, I was a huge Ugly Kid Joe fan. I don't know, maybe I was the only person that, only person that I knew uh, that was a big fan of theirs, but I love them. Um, so Dave Fortman was in a band called Sugar Tooth, and I don't know if you remember... Uh, if you're a kid from the 90s, Beavis and Butthead, they had a song on there called Sold My Fortune uh, be- after he quit the band. But he was recruited to join Ugly Kid Joe in like 92, and he stayed with them. And they had two monster hits, uh, I Hate Everything About You and their cover of Cats in the Cradle. Uh, so he toured the world with like Def Leppard and Van Halen and Bon Jovi and all these Ozzy Osbourne. I mean, just all the biggest rock stars. Uh, then the band broke up. Um, so you think like, oh, his career's over. Well, that's a pretty good career. But he ended up uh, going on to be this huge producer. Uh, he produced the albums for Godsmack, Slipknot, Simple Plan, and uh, the Monster Evanescence album that was huge in the 90s. Uh, he's got some great stories. And he even gives me a little bit of the dirt on the, the Godsmack song, Crying Like a Bitch, on who that's about. So check it out. I think you'll really enjoy this episode. Ah! Yes! We did it! Yeah. <laughs> you achieved it, bro. Fuck yeah, rules. <laughs> I gotta give you a little shit, man. Aren't you, like, one of the best, like, top producers? Yeah. Like, don't you have to know this technical shit for that? Yeah, apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Apparently you can just get by okay. without doing anything. <laughs> Holy fuck. Chuck, shoot! All right. All right, Dave Fortman. This is insane. I gotta show you this. Yeah. I know this is a... Uh, before you joined the band, it must have been like a month before you joined the band. But I was such a big Ugly Kid Joe fan, and you guys, no way. you get yeah, oh, huge. You never came to Seattle to put you play. You played like Rock Candy, which I think was twenty one and over. Um, so uh, I, I can never see you guys live. But I bought this bootleg. Oh, we were there with Jeff Leppard in the in the canyon outdoor concert. Oh, the Gorge. We played the Gorge with Jeff Leppard, Seattle. You missed it. I sh- I want to see. I want to see you guys headline, but three. yeah, I bought this uh, bootleg. It's like from. Uh, uh, it was must have been right before you joined the band because you joined in April. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was so cool. I loved um, I loved your uh, um, like banter the banter oh, wait, between the band. January, February, March. Oh no, I joined in April. Yeah, it was a month before I joined the band. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That was before, and then we yeah we didn't tour. Yeah, of course we were. Yeah. Really well, so this is this is cool. I'm kind of fanboying out here, but um, so I don't know if you ever listen to my show, but I always like to get the background with musicians, and I don't know um. I know you're from Louisiana, but did you uh, take music lessons? Like, when did you start playing music, and did you take lessons, uh, or are you self-taught? Or that's a good question because it, that's one of the things that no one ever really asks is how. That's a great question that that gets left out a lot. So, I mean, don't, I swear to God, like through every interview we've ever fucking done. But yeah, man, uh, my whole family was, were musicians. My dad played trumpet. My uh. brother, my both my brothers were were three years apart. I'm the youngest. Um, you know, and they they're. My oldest brother could, you know, write out a symphony orchestra. They were all band guys, really. And we grew up, you know, I started reading music when I was really young, four, four on drums, something like that, four years old. Four years, years old. old. Okay, wow. When I started to understand quarter notes and eighth notes, my, you know, my brother would teach me when I was little. And then we all played multiple instruments as kids. So early, early oh. on, you know, snare drum went into trumpet, which went into guitar and then piano. And so, you know, little bits of piano. Um, it wasn't really something I focused on that hard, but that's how you, that's how that kind of shit gets started. And so then my house, you know, we, in Louisiana, my mom raised us in a small little 1100 square foot little tiny house. And every bedroom was filled with somebody. We had a drum set in that, in that fucking place. Wow. <laughs> I used to ask my mom, how did you possibly survive it? She's like, well, I'd go take a walk. You know, because after school, we'd be jamming out, man. Like, yeah, just, but different songs. One guy would jump in there, one guy on piano, and then one guy on drums. Wow. And I would, you know, I, I would sit there and wait for, you know, Stairway to Heaven. I, because we were, you know, we'd be on vinyl and I'd have a, we had a Ludwig, a Ludwig, uh, whatever the hell that name, oh, a Selena and drum set, you know. So I put on Stairway to Heaven, you have to wait for the doo, 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 to come around, you know. I remember hitting it, it like it was real, man, when I was, you know, like 11 or 12 i beat the shit out of that drum set so can you play can you play every instrument you can uh you 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 sing you do guitar bass and drums keyboards everything yeah enough um you know i I play some mean drums people get surprised by that but it also helps me translate when i produce to be able to to back my words up you know if i need to play it for someone i can play it 
Yeah. You so know, you, I'm, really, I'm, I'm better at rhythm style drumming, not so much like double kick metal stuff that, yeah. that much. But I know I can talk in drum terms. Yeah, you, you started doing, uh, you started producing stuff just right out of high school with a four track, right? So I mean, yeah, that's where it all started. Yeah. yeah, and then you played in a band called Sugar Tooth, and that's how you kind of became friends with the guys in Ugly Kid Joe. Yep. Did that's you guys exactly. have it release any music when you were? I know they did that uh, "Sold My Fortune" song, but that was after you left. Did you guys release any music when you were in the band? Yeah, "Sold My Fortune" was uh, that album that came out. Had uh, I wrote the last song? Me and Mark wrote that last song. Oh, okay. It's an acoustic song on the record, yeah. Some of that was, uh, I was there for co-writing some of it, not a bunch of it. But and you played with uh, Joey Castillo from uh, Queens of the Stones, Stone Age, yeah. on that one. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, I'll tell, I mean that's an interesting. Uh, yeah, me and Joey really were two, uh, two guys that had been. I was, you know, my band came out from Los Angeles. Tim Groose, who was in Sugar Tooth, was a friend of mine from Louisiana, so we had hooked up. You know, and we would I'd go watch Timmy play. Um, in in what was we're gonna become Sugar Tooth. It was called She Died, and lo and behold, you know, in, in there they had a drummer and guitar player that they kicked out one weekend, and so the singer knew Joey from Wasted Youth from Los Angeles, and Timmy knew me. So we came together to fill in one one time, and it wasn't necessarily to try out or join. We were just gonna jam with them, and you know, Joey came over to me and said, "Man, I want I'd, I'd love to play with you, man." He goes, "I don't really like the band, but but I, but I'll play." just to play with you. And I said, I feel the same way. I said, I, I said, me and you, I think we could do this thing together, you know, because I saw him play. He saw me play. We were like, fuck, dude, we could just take the town. We could do it right That's now. That's awesome. And so at the time it was, it was, uh, Burko Weber, Robert Weber, who, who was, he became a and r guy signed like disturbed. Uh, and Burko was our big connection really to everything, but he just wasn't the greatest singer in the world, but a uh, great guy and a good networker. And he got us in all the clubs. So, the band that Joey didn't really like that much was really based on just, they were, they were not, you know, kind of sloppy version of what Sugar Tooth would become. Because okay. We ended up hiring uh, Mark, the singer, who was rad. Mark Hutton became the reason we could get a deal. Because people, once me and Joey started to play, then we'd, we'd go out and play the shows. And it really started sh shaking people up. You know, we were tearing it up in Hollywood. And the singer mm. was really the reason we couldn't get a record deal. We had a few people come out and, and look at it. And, and so then we went back and said, all right, we're going to have to fire Burko. And we, I ended up having an idea to get Mark Hutner, who was in this other band. that was a three piece that I loved from Hollywood. And as soon as he sat down and started singing, you know, he came and sat on the floor and started jamming out. That became the sugar tooth that got a record deal with Geffen. And so how did so, you become, you, you uh, became friends with Ugly Kid Joe because they were a fan of sugar tooth. I, I feel like I saw it with, well, with a sugar tooth t-shirt once. Uh, well, what it was, was, uh, yeah, I had a sugar tooth shirt on in the video neighbor. Yeah, but I mean, didn't Wit have one too? So Whit, you mean? I thought Wit had one too, like before you he joined him. Yeah, yeah. Well, what it was was, uh, you know, back when Burko was singing in the band, like that. I mean, that's how long I met. This as soon as we had, what happened is that Dennis Ryder, who was who became our manager of Wicked Joe, or was he was the lawyer for Wicked Joe at the time, and he also picked us up as sure uh, as she died uh, as a, being our lawyer as well. So. This is way before we were even about to get signed when in Sugar, in Sugar Tooth, basically. Uh, we still had Burko. We and Klaus were at a dinner at his house one night, and I met him. So then we started just hanging out. We were mm. friends. Like, we were hanging every weekend, and they were coming to see me play. I was going to Was that with them. when they were big, or was that before they had, like... Uh, they were, they were, hadn't made the EP yet. Okay. Oh, wow. Because that was a short time I, I found out that they started the, doing the demos, and they made that EP. They got signed, like, a month later, is what Wit said. I don't know yeah, if... Yeah, it went pretty quick, you know, and... Uh, they had, uh, they were in the process of getting ready to do, uh, do all that stuff. You know, they, had, I was there like with the first gig Cordell ever played, you know, when they hired Cordell, mm -hmm. I saw that gig in Isla Vista. And so they were really, they became really my best friends, honestly. And, uh, well, that's cool. towards the time when they started taking off everything about you starting to boil. Um, and Witt had always, Witt had been kind of torturing Roger on the road and, and he would always play the sugar tooth demos on the bus <laughs> you know, that first tour they ever had. And he wanted to get me in a band. And, and, I, and honestly, I was so freaked out about ruining Sugar Tooth's record deal because we had a record deal for about, it was a half million dollar deal back then. It was huge between- Wow. We had gotten capital and, and Geffen got a bidding war over Sugar Tooth. So we were on the cusp of about to sign the thing. And here I am trying to make this decision to, to jump ship and to, to get into Ugly Kid Joe as they were about to leave to become super famous. Wow. They were already, they were starting to hit. They, they had just gotten into MTV. 
and it was apparent that they were going to be a platinum band, you know. So we had finally come and said, you know, him and Dennis both were like, hey, this is it, man. Like, you, you should join. You know, we're about to take off and do this thing, man. You know, we're going to go and make a record. And so I, can't, I thought, and you know what I figured out was that Mark, the guy we hired to be the singer of Sugartooth, really, I forgot he was such a great guitar player. I'm like, wait a minute. And his usual show was uh-huh. him playing guitar singing. And so I'm like, wait, he could just play the guitar again and they could become a four piece band. Oh, there not you go. Five piece. He could do all my parts easily in Sugar Tooth, you know? Okay. So, and, he, and it would be more comfortable for him because that's what he's used to doing. Yeah. That was his forte, it was really to be able to sing and play guitar. So I, I came to practice that time and they all congratulated me. You know, they knew that, that I was going to go and be on MTV and shit, you know, because so, was taken off. So, what happened sure. with Roger? Because all I saw was that there was musical differences. Did he did he want to do the band more metal or did they want to do more metal or what was, do you know oh, what that yeah, was? Yeah, no, there was never any kind of musical differences. Uh, he wasn't a real big writer. Yeah, it was, it was just, personality differences really oh, okay yeah they we, we, and, i mean he's just a different kind of dude you know the guy that writes his name so names like the story with him writing his name on the orange juices and shit in the fridge and i love this didn't went to go drink him anyway <laughs> it's, you know he, he, and uh it's kind of like the odd couple then or something like that kind yeah, of you know and look okay. man back then the, you know there was the birth of like the new thing, you know, everything was happening right then. All the birth of grunge and everything was brand new. So it was mm-hmm. everybody was sort of in a pool of, you know, we were, I was fr- I was really good friends with Shannon Hoon, you know, and everybody was trying to figure out what this new thing was going to be when it exploded. And luckily, we got a little piece of it as well, but it became Seattle. But L.A. is one of the, the premier first real grunge bands of L.A. was us, was Sugar Tooth. We were the sort of, the, we were like the Seattle version band. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, so, so, so yeah. So the the music scene was obviously changing. Uh, yeah. Did you have to so audition, really, or did they just bring you in? He, when they became friends with me, then I started. I'd play guitar up there all the time. A lot of I think they were probably going to kick Roger out anyway. But one of the things the thing I think Wit really wanted to get me in the band. He because he Whit, me and him were like best bros. I would come up and play guitar and jam out and sing my songs and stuff around. You know, campfire it and Isla Vista. Uh, and then they would come see me play, and we were one of those bands where we were, you know, we were shocking live, man. We were rap. Now, you know, let me pat myself on the back. <laughs> we were, at the time, it was something really cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? So then he, that gets the sound of the way I played lead, you know, Wit would always sit in the back of the bus and be telling uh, whoever in the band, you know, we got to get that sound, bro. You know, at least that's what I hear. Yeah. So that was a lot of Roger's demise, you know. And so he, you know, Wit had me come all the way up to Hollywood Vista and start pre-production with him and then roger didn't even know when he picked up he opened up the garage door one day and i was like oh jesus and he's like hey dude what's up dude and i'm like oh fuck oh they didn't tell him that he was kicked out yeah they, he knew he was out he, they didn't they didn't he was wondering who they were gonna hire and of oh. course he had already figured it out he knew because he could tell it was coming man oh. me and Whit would, would be throwing down every weekend okay and he'd be around you know roger would be around there so yeah so you made that uh, i mean obviously the ep was doing really well. And then you joined, you, you did you, so you did some of the shows before you guys went into pre-production for uh, America's least wanted or. No, we went right into the pre-pro. As soon okay. as I joined the band, we, then we went right in right. and then did some pre-pro about a week. And then we went right into the studio. Is it true yeah, that you guys kind of rushed the production because you wanted to get on tour with Ozzy? Like I heard wit had yeah. to actually fly back to do some uh, vocal changes because. Yeah, to finish up, we were, we had already gone out on the road when we finished the album and there was some things had to be cashed up we were listening to mixes on long tour but what a what a rush for me because i first joined the band and actually we played the first mtv video music i'm sorry uh, movie awards man. movie awards it was the first show i ever played with the band i had to play in front of like you know 200 million worldwide viewers on television before i ever got to play on stage with them. that was really frightening oh i bet yeah so then that's exciting that... nevertheless i was like wow you know yeah it was rad. No, so then the really album's cool. released, and I remember I bought the I bought it like right when it came out, so it's got the Statue of Liberty like giving the finger. But then they edited that cover, and they made, and then you guys had to change it, and you put the the uh, uh, mascot and the bandages and stuff. Did that piss you guys off? Oh, for America's Least Wanted. Yeah. I don't know uh, what the, the edit edited part. Where that I mean, edited version went? Where where did that go? I don't remember that at all. I don't know. I just, rem- I just remember that the, uh, the cover art was the, they had the kid with the statue of Liberty flipping the the bird. And then oh. they, they, instead of like just having tape over it or a, a sticker, I felt like they, they had the, the, the ugly kid Joe mascot was all bandaged up. Did you never saw that cover version? Yeah, I saw that. 
I can't remember why these is too long ago now, but I know America's Least Wanted went out and sold a platinum amount of records with the original artwork, though, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, there, was, was, maybe there was, was two versions. Censored, no, there was for a censored version of it. Yeah. There was an album that you could buy that had that. That's what it was. Oh, okay. Made, yeah. Maybe some of the, the words that were out of the, taken out of the songs, too. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. Do they even still do that now with albums? Do they do censored version? I guess they probably do, huh? Yeah, I have. Well, I have. You make clean versions no matter what. Most how do you how do you do the clean version? Do you have to re-sing it, or could they just uh, enter in a word? Uh, sometimes it depends. We've done it a million ways. Uh, if I produce, then we'll go in and either put the white noise like in that spot, or okay. kill it all together, or you make the word backwards, or you have them sing a different word. Oh, okay. You know, the, gotcha. The you, you just go punch that word in, or you do it while you're on it because you know it's coming. You know? Yeah. All right, we'll get a clean version of that real quick. If somebody's got a motherfucker in the song. Then you figure out some way to fix it. Yeah, it, you know? <laughs> that's cool. So yeah, so then you guys, uh, you're touring. You were like the opening band for a lot of big name, and like you said, you toured with Death Leopard. Sounds like there was a lot of like yeah. stuff happening behind the scenes with that tour. Oh, we were. The, we, I mean, the opening. We were like the, the kings of the opening bands. Which you know, our biggest headline thing was only. People, people generally have imagined us being a lot bigger than we really were. You know, live, our, our, I think our largest headline was right around three, 4,000 or something in America ever. Oh. But yeah, we went on these giant tours. And the Death Leopard one, you know, in, in particular was fucking radical. It was so such a long tour. I mean, we toured like four months with those guys or something. 79 shows worldwide. Yeah. Those dudes. An incredible run, man. So are the they... Shit, I got to play on stage with them seven times uh because me and phil were messing around backstage well uh, because it was a really lengthy tour it'd be days off and things so it was a lot of time to noodle around and uh i started playing slide guitar i was practicing a lap you know like a little lap slide i had and we started playing two steps behind me and him and joe heard it one day and was like oh we gotta do that on stage you know and i'm not that proficient man it it, it it lap steel, you know. I'm better at playing upright where I just play it normally, like a slide. Sure. And it, it was a scary fucking moment for me, but it, it was it was cool. It was it's probably the I, what is the pinnacle of all live performance things for me. It's the you know the biggest moment I've ever been on a stage playing with yeah actually with Def Leppard, not with just opening Def, Le Def Leppard in a song with him. And you know I got to get with Craig, man, our the, uh, good friend of ours that filmed all of it. There's film of me doing it. I'd love to have it. You know. Actually, oh yeah. You know, it'd be something that should be live on YouTube forever. Just like everything else, you know. But, oh, yeah, definitely. Get out. Somebody's yeah. got that somewhere. Yeah. So yeah. So was was Def Leppard at this point in their career? Had they kind of like settled down their kind of party lifestyle, or are they still going pretty crazy? Because you guys were like the young, you know, younger uh, yeah. band that was just, they, you know, you were definitely not settled down your party lifestyle at that point. Oh no, no, yeah. No, they they were pretty. I mean, they're like they're just one of a kind. Those dudes are just classic guys, man. You know? You know, they're the nicest people you ever met. You know, they're, they're a lot more humble than, than you would imagine. You know, like Joe, it's he pretty, for all accounts I, I could ever find, he was an anti rock star guy, man. He's, you know, real humble, like critical of himself all the time. Hated his own voice, you know, how all the stories, you know, he's telling these stories about how he'd written uh, Pour Some Sugar on Me because he was just, he said, I would hum shit, you know, and he was sitting over by a road case humming shit and the, the, one of the roadies walked by and said, what the fuck did you say, mate? Like, pull some sugar on me. And he's like, that'll work. <laughs> you know, <yeah>. Wow. That's <laughs> cool. He, yeah. He like, he said, you know, Mutt Lane beat him to death. Just me and, you know, and like, but as, as party animals, yeah, they were, you know, it wasn't like they were, they go out raging, but they had, they, they were pretty wild types of, they, you know, they were rock and roll still for sure. You know, like they, they would drink and, you know, they were funny and, you know, they weren't, wasn't Motley Crue level out of control, but, it was a rad, I mean, it was just a rad time, man. It was such an easy summer tour, you know. We yeah. Show up at four o'clock. Imagine, you know, you're doing American Sheds, you know, you got, it's summer. You show up at four, sound check. You don't even be, you don't have to be on stage till 7.45. And then you get off at like 8.20 or something, or, you know, or probably earlier now. Get off at like uh, 7.45 till like, what would that be? Like 8.30. Okay. Like really, you know, 45 minutes set, man. Done out all your best songs and you can just go and then you have all night to party and you have to be there for the next day it's just i mean it was the easiest schedule and it wasn't every single day like they would have days off in that tour so and, and uh, oh, it was catered every town would have their own food they would bring like whatever they think it's like this you know kansas barbecue oh. somebody you know it was fantastic it was it was, it was out of control that sounds amazing that aussie tour 
was a lot like that. But the, but the real, the most insane fan kind of moment was when we toured with Bon Jovi. Oh, really? Even more so than Van Halen? No, that's what I'm going to get to. Yeah, Van Halen was, but they were the warm up band for Bon Jovi. And so were we. We were before Van Halen. And that, I mean, I, I, I just, you know, could never, I still can't believe we actually did that. You know, and I'm sitting there eating lunch with Eddie Van Halen two or three times in the tent, just me and him alone. So does I'm that. Sitting backstage with him and him and Alex. You yeah. Know, just teaching me drone rudiments. Didn't you, I heard and, you uh, say Ed, like. Ed he played me Mean Street in his underwear. Yeah, he was, he was playing Mean Street in his underwear. So does that ruin the fantasy a little bit? Or is that like just taking it to the uh, next it level? Just made it like. Made it just so cool. Like just how <laughs> rap. Just there was there were such they were so Californian, man. They were they were just really they were they were just so Californian. Like they're uh, once again just really just regular dudes that you would never imagine like that they could be that that nor just because that's what they've been doing the whole time. They don't really see the things around them happening so much. Oh. You know? I mean, they're just being that guy. You know, they're just like yeah, I'm sad, dude. You know, the <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, by I mean, hundred percent. Like, I guess you could call it dude bros in a way. Like, like Michael Anthony. Like, as soon as we meet him, he's all, "Yeah, dude." So, okay, Moby works with you guys, man. He goes, "Yeah, my my thing. My cousin sold him his Trans Am, dude." You know, <laughs> like it's all kind just of random, crap. just down to earth, regular guys. Yeah, like Pasadena, California dudes, man. Like, and and shit, and they loved us because we had we were touring Europe, and they nobody believe it or not didn't no one knew the van halen hits that we all know in america so well really in europe the only hit they really had was jump and they weren't playing it in the set huh. so the record company had to come to van halen and say hey you guys should really be playing jump man because it's it's the only real song you got that people can love because we least like we were on the side of the stage every night right mm -hmm. so we're sitting there watching you know fuck there was sixty thousand to eighty thousand people in these stadiums so we're watching like they're playing like fucking, you know, ain't talking about love, man, or, or like girl, you really got me. And there's no one responding, just like. But they came to the there. show. Why'd they come to the show if they don't know the songs? Just. Well, they no, they were there to see Bon Jovi. Oh, because it's Bon Jovi, movie. Van Halen, and you guys? Yeah, it was uh, three of us, yeah. Holy shit, that would be an amazing yeah, were, show. Yeah, for, for parts of that tour, it wasn't, if Van Halen was in on about 13 or 14 shows of it. Okay. And there was another warm up band, uh, Thunder or somebody that was also right. in the middle. But we were there with Bon Jovi almost the whole time. What's Bon Jovi we like? First, What's... Somebody was in the middle. Yeah. But yeah, that's how, that's, it was Bon Jovi that got them to be the warm-up band in the middle for whatever 13, 14 shows that was that changed my life, man. Yeah. With those guys. And then so eventually they started playing Jump and then they got a crowd response out of it. You know, and I, we, we were talking about it. Ed's like, yeah, dude. It's like, party was over here, bro. We just didn't get invited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, fuck it. You know, you took over America, man. You know, yeah. I was like, God. So does John Bon Jovi, pretty cool guy. Too. Did you get to hang out with him at all? Oh, God, yeah. Well, we, you know, we had known him from earlier. We were the same label. That's the reason where the whole thing's even Polygram, happened. I think, right? Or Mercury? Yeah, we're all both on Mercury Records, right? And just the sweetest guy. We, we got to meet him because we played with him in Australia at the Australian Grammys uh, back in 92, I think it was. We went down there and... I mean, he's that dude. He's just about as nice as a man can be. I mean, that's why he, I, he, part of his success is just his ability to remain absolutely lovely at all times. It's a really cool dude. Uh, you know, he back then they had, you know, camcorders were like a big thing, you know. So he brought like all five camcorders in his arms to our hotel rooms and brought them and gave us gave us camcorders personally to go film shows and have fun with. That kind of guy. You know? Where is then, those? Where's the footage of this? Do, can I find this online? You no, know, we didn't use them. <laughs> no one ever fucking did anything. Oh the shit, that would have been cool. Because there's so much yeah. hijinks with your band. I, really I wish there was footage of all the shit. There's not though, really. Yeah. Back in those days, nobody. It wasn't a big deal to, to try to document all of it, you know. Right. But and then that and then that, I swear the fucking night that John put. The, there's bars on the stage, right? I yeah. was telling this, I don't know if you heard the other podcast I did. Did you listen to I did, podcast? yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. I was on the edge of my seat. Oh, I oh, love, your no, stories are great. Stories. Yeah, there's some great stories. And it's that night, man, me and Klaus, there, there's bars on stage, you know, like fucking literal, you know, five or six stools in a bar and somebody back there. Like on the friends. side stage, right? Like if you were looking like I'm the stage, well, here are two bars. Like they're bars behind, like, and there's the drums where my head is. There's yeah. bars right here. That's there's badass. Bars. People hanging out, man. So it looks like this, and you got these giant fucking blow up things that are about a, yeah, about 100 feet tall. They're huge. Fucking 75 to 100 foot tall blow up things. 
big old characters hanging out, you know? And so we would become part of the bar. They would get people, fans to sit at the bar, like VIPs. And so it looked like this cool scene on stage. It's just this map. Oh, I bet. Stage. And there's two bars at it, man, with lights. Shit. And so me and Klaus are sitting there on the stool, and John came up in, uh, what was it? Not Living on a Prayer. What's the other one? Shout to the Heart? Bad Medicine? Yeah, one of those. Yeah, I forgot what song it was now. I might have gotten it wrong on the other podcast, too. But <laughs> he goes up. I might have been living. I think it was living on a prayer. And he comes up to Klaus. He let him take a shot at the fucking lead vocal on the on the microphone on John's mic, and Klaus belted it out. It was horrifying. <laughs> it was awful. It was, I fucking laugh so hard, man. And the next night we're sitting in the same two stools oh. in the next city, and he comes up like he's gonna do it again. He's all, oh no, to Klaus. I get, man, every time me and I bring that up, we just start laughing like, holy fuck, that really happened. So yeah, because Klaus was, doesn't do backup vocals for you guys or anything, or. He, he yells and whatnot. <laughs> you know, he Klaus can hold a tune. He does, uh, yeah. you know, Mr. Record Man. He sings. Oh, that's him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fun time when he does that. He he really pulls it off well. Yeah, I like but that. No, he's not. He's not. A, he doesn't come up and start actually singing any kind of like harmonies. And right. Stuff. Right. Yeah. No, that's hard. So you guys, you guys are on the top at the top of the world. You won. Uh, I don't know if you won a lot of other awards, but I know you won. Uh, the best, uh, I think it was the best new band in Metal Edge, which I was a big Metal Edge guy. I don't know if you read that magazine at all, or did you care? Yeah, for sure. I did. Yeah, I was into yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, that oh, was... that's cool. I, you know, I forgot. I've all, all but forgotten the award, the awards that Ugly Kids ever won. But that's cool. We did at some point win something in Metal Edge, right? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and I mean, wow. you got to tour with all your, your heroes and Metallica. or did You you didn't tour with Metallica, but you hung out with them before, right? Well, yeah, a couple times. Um it all started when uh, Kirk was dating uh, this chick, Sarah, that had grew up, I should say, grown up with Klaus and Witt that were you know, neighborhood friends or whatever. And so I, we just went partying, I think, one time in San Francisco. We played a show. And I think Kirk came and we went out and hung out with him and, and Sarah. And then later uh, got asked to go hang in Paris, which was rad. I mean, I, I've never seen anything like it. The show was insane. This is when they, you know, this black album oh. they were huge, man. You know, they were badass. And so then we go into a big club in Paris, packed out with a thousand people. They have a roped off area where you party at. And we were, we were literally all sitting there raging and wit passed out. Kurt drew a fucking cross on his face <laughs> with a sharpie. <laughs> Top to bottom, all the way across like that. And he just went, sat there for hours, passed out, you know, oh, it was hilarious, man. I've never seen people like, I've, I haven't, that's the only time I've ever really been around super rock stardom when it, when they're partying and, and there's people looking at you like, like you're partying and there's some guy just staring at you, you know, like just looking at you. Yeah. Like, he's like 10 feet away. They got a rope over there. We're sitting there <laughs> drinking and laughing and these people are just staring at us. Yeah. Partying. Cause it's like, like wow. you're famous like, rock stars. That's really cool. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's how Metallica lives, man. And we just had sushi with, uh, with Rob and Kirk. Me and Whit went and had sushi with them. Whit knows them real well. Whit we'll, plays in the wedding band, you know, with them. Oh, really? Yeah, he played. Uh, Whit's in a band with Rob and Kirk. And Joey Castillo played a couple shows with them now. Believe it or not, full circle. Isn't that crazy? My wow, that is crazy. With them. Yeah, they played they, they, well, they played a wedding for uh, Kelly Slater's friend or something in Hawaii. Because Kirk's a big surfer. Okay. So it became a thing. So now they, they made it called the wedding band. They jammed together and Whit sings. Wow. Two of the guys from the are in that band, yeah. And so That's crazy. We, uh, just the funniest. I mean, Kirk's one of the funniest people you ever meet. God, he had me dying. This in Amsterdam. This is last year. We were at, we ate at the hotel where they're at, you know, in sushi, and then they call us, we ate again the next night at the sushi restaurant. Um, and the shit this ah, oh, the stories, man, you know, in <laughs> Kirk's talking about how when they toured with Angus Young and, and ACDC, the Angus didn't even meet any, didn't talk to anybody in Metallica. He just would sit and chain smoke without drinking with his bodyguard. And he didn't say a fucking word to any of them. Never met any of them. You know, that's how private and weird those dudes were. Wow. And he still, he goes, and he was this tall. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I've seen him live. Yeah, he's tiny. Amazing you know, guitar we, player. We that was so fucking funny. It's just <laughs> so, yeah, back, going back to your history there. So, then your drummer, Mark Davis, he leaves and he's replaced by uh, Shannon, who's a, yeah, the yeah. current drummer in uh, Godsmack. But I was always curious about this because Mark said that he, he wanted to step away from the limelight. Like, that's always like shocking to me because I do these interviews and I interview these people that I'm like, how did you get to this level of success? And so Mark was there and then he's just like, nah, this isn't for me. Yeah. He, uh, you know, 
he was a little older than all of us were. Um, and he really, you know, he had fallen in love with Carrie and um, his, his wife right now, whatever. And so, yeah, at some point, you know, he just wasn't feeling it. And I think he wanted hmm. to be more, he wanted to be home and to, to I'm sure she was some pressure coming from her. And he went for the family life big time. He sure. you know, what he did was she became an accountant and uh, he was Mr. Mom for decades. You know, he raised those children himself. Wow. He went big time on it, big time dad, which, you know, I got to commend him on that. You know, I'm a father as well. But he went early on, man, he, he turned 30 and he went after that kind of life. And, you know, then that was it. We found Shannon and moved to the next step, you know. Wow. That's, that's kind of like admirable, I guess. I mean, it kind of takes balls to step away from that too. It's pretty cool. I mean, if that's what you really want, but yeah, it was good. It was uh, your guys' gain or Shannon's gain because he got to join the band. And then, I mean, it was like, you guys didn't miss a beat. So it's so, you know, I think it just comes to different personalities. Some people, the road is really brutal on them. You know, it's just, you know, there's certain types of people that are better, but they just want to be in a, in a, in a, kind of repetitive daily situation you know mm-hmm. like right now in my life like i just i just quit touring as well because it's too it, i discovered i have my hearing test done and it's it, i've lost it's just a pinch on my right ear and it's definitely because of the drum set i've toured for the last three years oh. and i haven't done that since i started producing and so i've noticed a little bit of difference i don't want to lose anymore you know at all so i want to quit while i'm ahead so you'll, you'll, I, you'll never do shows again like earplugs you know so you'll never do shows again I'm not going to do a major tour again now. No. Oh, wow. Well, so would, what would Ugly Kid Joe tour? Fun, but it's not that fun. You know, it's, oh, it's yeah. not working for me. You know, because in the end, what I, you know, I really want to, you know, I moved, I moved to Florida to retire down here. Chandler lives here. I moved to me and him in the same town now. And I'm putting a fucking little SSL in my condo and my room. Right here where I'm sitting will be like a desk. And I, that, the thing I really love to do is that, you know, even if I'm not doing it for a record or something else, I still... I've always loved audio. Like when I was in high school, I'm still doing the same thing I did back then on a four track, just on a larger scale. And so I don't want to lose the ability to enjoy that, you know, to, to understand the beauty of music and to hear things the way I hear them, to be able to, to say, wow, you know, that is incredible. You know, and if you, still, you start losing your hearing, then those things go away. Degradation so, is. Yeah. Hot, you, know? you can't wear like a, a earplug or something to, to protect live, it. I, no. oh. It takes all the fun out of it. Now you got, I have to feel it. Like I, we're live monitor kind of guys, man. I can't, I can't play with, I feel like I'm deaf and I can't understand what's going on, huh? Oh. You know, we, we play off the cues. We're, we're an interactive, funny kind of band and earplugs won't work at all. There's no way. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll say something subtle that I need to cue off of and I won't hear it or I can't feel the energy of the show. I'm not about that at all. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's too much, you know. That's sad. It was fun to do three years of it. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I never had been doing five years before I jumped back in anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, so then um, you guys, when you recorded a uh, menace of sobriety, um, you, you took the mascot off the uh, album cover. Was that, was that a conscious decision to do that? Like what was the theory? Cause I, I love the mascot. I love the ugly kid, Joe cartoon. I thought that was like part wow. of the appeal oh, to yeah, the yeah. band for me. You know, I never thought about that. Wow. I don't know. I'm not sure why. Oh, okay. I, you know, I can't remember back then. I think that we were so <laughs> she's like crazy. We just saw this kid drinking on a postcard and decided that'd be the album cover. <laughs> like it was, I don't think we, no one ever, I don't think anyone ever said, oh, we're, we're getting rid of the kid, you guys. You yeah. Know, nobody ever, I don't think anyone ever made that thought. I've never thought of that. Like we were killing the kid that people loved. Yeah. I love the, yeah. I mean, and then like that now, album. We, I think we were so dingy back then. We were just all. Oh my God, that rules. Look at this, a kid drinking a beer. It's in Germany, some <laughs> postcard. And then we made that the album cover and it was that easy. Like, no, Wow, yeah. that's kind of cool Which though. Is, I don't think anyone said, wait, maybe we ought to have the kid back on. The <laughs> Did you guys have a manager back then or I anything? You got... Huh? Did you have a manager or anything back then? Or Yeah, man. Yeah. Dennis Ryder was our manager, yeah. Okay, so he was just like, yeah, that's cool. Whatever, whatever you guys want. No one ever questioned it. No, that's I mean, cool. it's the first time I've ever thought about that. So yeah, that, that album is interesting too. Cause like I went and re-listened to it today and uh, it, it, you know, I, I have a different appreciation for it now. And it was the same thing, like yeah. with the song that you wrote on America's least wanted busy B. I think at the time busy when B, I, yeah. I first heard that song, I was like, Oh, that's like a slow song, you know, but now I listen yeah. to it and I go, that's actually like a really good song. And this is like whatever, 30, 30 years later, almost. I mean, that song still holds the test of time. Oh uh, yeah. Now my stuff. Yeah. It's one of the reasons I want to get back on tour, you know, Whit told me, he's like, man, you know, your songs definitely stood out when we're playing a half Fortman set now. 
So you should see, you should come check it out and play it again and, and kind of, you know, re- get the rewards of what you've done. Yeah. And in Minister Sobriety, a lot of people say that, you know, the bass player, Witt's been to the bass player from Faith the More, and he told Witt, he goes, yeah, history will judge you guys differently after he had listened to Minister Sobriety. He was like, okay, well, there, that's a different band than I thought. Because there are some moments where it is, you know, timeless rock happening, in, you know, especially in that album. Yeah, well, that's what's interesting, because it was kind of like you were saying earlier, like, this whole grunge thing was happening and you guys were kind of metal. You weren't, what is the, what is the line yeah. from uh we ain't glam and we ain't thrash. Like, but you weren't, you weren't glam. Yeah. You weren't really thrash. You're kind of uh, metal, but then you got really. like stuff like busy B and you got like some funky songs. Yeah. So like, how would you describe yeah. your sound? Uh, we were, we, I would say at that point in time, we were like a rhythmic metal rock. We were, see metal was like metal, like glam, yeah, and then but metal rock was, all, and it still is to this day. It, it's you know it's rock and roll with metal influences. You know, because we were obviously all from the same school of Van Halen, Ozzy, you know, Judas Priest, Priest, yeah. Rain, and all those things like that. And those things aren't the glammy kind of squeezy metal. Those those things are rock and roll. A lot of those albums, man, you listen to the Priest. So there's a lot of rock and roll happening. You know, and I'm a big mm-hmm. Skinner fan. Obviously, you can hear that. I sound like Alan Collins when I play. Um. Those influences uh, created what I would say is like kind of a, a early on a definite funk thing, you know, with with those guys. But they that was with them writing. But Minister Sobriety was probably you know 40, 50 percent me. So that style really, I mean, was I would it was me, which is like rock and roll kind of funky Skinner thing. I mean, can't you see them is really one of the de- definitive things I've ever written that just tears a fucking audience in half. You know, people love that. And that's yeah. kind of a funky, it's like Aerosmith chili peppers, really. Yeah, know? no, there's like definitely a lot of different sounds coming in. But I heard you say on the, I think it was on the other podcast, you were saying that um, a lot of guys didn't like you, that you you tried, you guys tried to go see the Black Crows and Chris Robinson was oh, like, no. It was what? a fucking disaster, man. Why? No one could stand it. You know, that, well, because we were still a little, you know, Wit's voice was a pinch of that metal kind of Vince Neil thing. Yeah, which now it came back around to where that's something that people don't don't bum out on at all. But they bummed yeah. on it back then. We were still uh-huh. considered to be that. Oh, here's this little bit of cheese metal in this band, except for their funny and their funky little bit of Chili Peppers kind of sound. And so that was something that when grunge was coming out was easy to hate, and they did. They no one no one wanted to deal with it. You know, hmm. a lot of people that were writing articles about it. You know, and things would would we get torn apart, man, and just it'd be in. No one can understand how we're selling a million records, but we were, you know, and, yeah. and the guy, I remember Paul, what's his name? He was a famous English writer once said, you know, um, it's your fault, readers, that these people are famous because you don't want to find the fucking record and you're not telling anybody. You So stop keeping secrets. <laughs> yeah. Well, some, so some of the people that were fans were uh, uh, Dimebag and Vinny from Pantera liked you guys. Hootie and the Blowfish, the guitarist, liked you. Poison yeah. was a fan of you guys. So, I mean, you had a pretty good yeah, range of people. people see they were early on see I, I doubt if you know up until the point we did become friends with scott Ian and you know we played with anthrax then dime and vinnie were at that show so they got another view of what we were all about and then well it was all because of shannon they knew shannon from way back shannon was friends with pantera uh from um rat child, uh, sorry rat child america okay and that well that's what you know when they would see us play live well then you get to hear all these songs that nobody's heard before yeah aren't like everything about you you know they're more serious rock and more serious right. metal and you get to hear which showcase his voice made shannon the whole the talent spectrum across the board people didn't understand that, that that's what's inside that band you got this guy that can lead an audience and sing his balls off but then he's backed up now with shannon by fucking world-class players all around i mean cordell is probably still one of the best bass players I've ever used in a session as a producer. I mean, even he's that good. I mean, the guy's wow. fucking, he played with B.B. King, you know, I got to do a session or something when he was like 12. This motherfucker can play the bass, man. So when you have a drum in a rhythm section that good and they're and it's so locked in that, it, it, you know how that goes in a live concert, that changes oh, yeah. everything. And then now you got two guitar players, both can play actual leads that aren't over the top cheesy or not, but they're melodic kind of leads. And you got a singer that's fucking killing it, nailing it every time he sings. And when you put that together, I don't care who you are, as long as you're not singing something over the top ridiculous and the worst song you ever heard, that's an impressive thing to see live. So those yeah. people kind of got reintroduced to us. Everyone ever that ever saw us live did, really. <sighs> From the moment that we got Shannon, 
you know. I hope I can see you guys live someday. I've still never been uh, able to see you guys live. I, I want to see you live someday. Oh, man. Well, yeah, yeah. <sighs> that well, sucks. Yeah, you're yeah. not touring well, anymore. If you, if you go and look at, uh, if you look at Can't You See Them live at Rock and Ring 1995, it'll tell you exactly what it's all about, you know. Yeah. That's a hell of a band, man. I mean, that, that's tearing it down. There's all kinds of, that's one of the videos from back in 95 that shows you Shannon's ability and, and him and Cordell when the breakdown happens. I mean, we, that band was tearing it up. Right. You know, we were, badass back then so what yeah, happened we we're the, we were yeah. the festival band that was dangerous you know yeah so what happened with the end was it so, just you guys got burned out around 97 when you first broke up yeah it um it became one of those things where it, it's just been so long and, and the album wasn't doing good we you know in the clubs it wasn't what i mean people come out and see us anymore in clubs in america so it was klaus didn't want to do it anymore so him being you know the mediator it was kind of the glue between us all, you know, the most diplomatic, even keel dude in the band. And yeah. So when you take him out of the equation, we're all looking at each other like, fuck that, you know, I'm not going to be in a band. So this is amazing. I didn't know this when I looked you up to reach out uh, just because I just wanted to interview because Ugly Kid Joe, I didn't even know you did this whole other producing career. That's like amazing. You So you moved to Louisiana and you started yeah. just producing some local stuff. And then uh, uh, Wind Up Records actually offered you a job as a vice president, and you turned it down. And then, but then they they had this other band. It was like this three piece. They gave you some demos, and uh, they were Southern people, and it was like operetta. And uh, it was originally a Christian band, but it turned out that that was Evanescence, and you yeah. produced this monster album that went crazy. Yeah, it changed everything. It really did. Yeah, that insanely. Uh, changed my life overnight it really did you, you know, feel like you kind of got up to that yeah you know, i was happy i had, had four or five national releases with phil and selmo and with the uh, crowbar all the nola bands but until 12 stones walked in the door and they got a, a deal with wind up which allowed me to co-produce with jay Baumgartner. um and that's how i got in the door with wind up and up until that moment i mean it was really about just surviving and trying to make some cash pay bills and whatnot for the kids but then Evanescence hit, and then that really got me into the, into the world of like where people now really want to hire you to do things, you know. And so then I led, of course, next thing after that was Mudvayne. I got to do that gold record with Happy on it. Um, another big one. And then from that, I got Slipknot, All Hope Is Gone. Then from there, with Godsmack, you know, two right. different, three different releases, them, you know. So right in, in a short span of time, I put three of the four of the biggest bands in metal, you know, in my, in my I, you know, Evanescence is probably the biggest song pop wise that I'll, I'll ever do. But the, the biggest record, the most important thing I've ever done is without a doubt, all hope is gone. Slipknot, because they're number two in the world under Metallica. I don't think they're going anywhere as far as that oh. title. And, and you can't say that about any other band I, that I've worked with. Yeah. Slipknot is the second largest metal band in the world underneath Metallica. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know they were that big well, worldwide. No, it's, worldwide, they're huge. It's interesting, oh like you telling me Van Halen doesn't have uh, hits in in Europe. That's like so. I, it's always interesting to hear because yeah. you travel the world, so you know a lot more about how the the rest of the parts of the world view other bands. So, right. Yeah. So, and, yeah, well, back in the day, you know, the market uh, they were concentrating on America. Van Halen was, but Slipknot fills up thirty thousand people in sheds worldwide. I mean, this is everywhere. You know, this that album's massive that I did uh, worldwide. It's insane. I mean, the amount of like their their popularity their fame level is so huge i mean they're number two to metallica it's not even not even a close second that i know of yeah and you said Corey he taylor were, was he was even better than amy lee in the studio like yeah. you would only have to do like three takes and you're like uh, i guess that's I, he, I don't know why we're gonna do any more takes that was perfect yeah, it, and it, you know it, and it was such a weird thing to do because it was like you you want to fucking change something so you don't think so the guy didn't think you're a fucking hack you know <laughs> <laughs> like I was sitting there going like, God, God, should I just change things just so he doesn't think I'm not doing anything? You right. Know, like, and then I kept thinking, I, I don't want to do anything to it because I know I got it. It's right there. I just, I just heard the future. You know, I hear it. There it is. Bam. I got it. So do I go fuck with it? And then all of a sudden, then his mentality changes and I lose what I just had. And he doesn't want to go back to what I just, you know, it could get yeah. in that shit show. If, if you've already got something, it's best to leave it the fuck alone. You know what I mean? Right. If you know in your heart, like I knew in my heart when he, when he had done a few of those songs, I'm like, okay, that shit is fucking rad. 
So it's like different. That, it's like, different depending on the band you're working with. Because I think early you were saying that uh, one of the bands had nicknamed you the butcher because you had cut so many pieces of different things that uh, you had done so many things. So with other bands, if they're yeah. really high level, you don't have to do as much. Well, arrangement wise, we it seems like we always arrange things. You know, me and Corey cut down a, a, some songs. We would do things on the spot. Um, a little bit less arrangement for sure for Slipknot. A lot of it with Mudvayne. Godsmack a little bit less. There was some things we would do, but all was kind of joint. Oh, uh, Evanescence a bunch. We would we I would go and make arrangements out of what they had, try to make them better, and it worked. Bring me to life, you know. If, if you know arrangements like the 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 bridge, you know, when it finally gets into the first Bring Me to Life bridge section before Frozen in Time, there's two different eight bar sections, right? Well, the first one of those was always after every chorus, and I, I hated that. I was like, man, it sounds like you're going to a bridge every chorus. So we took that mm. out of the first chorus and the second chorus then you go into it and make it into a bridge and so the whole outro i changed a bunch on that that's probably the most important arrangement work i've ever done that got me to where i'm at and you so, didn't think that that was gonna you didn't know you thought oh maybe this will be fun for my music nerd friends but you didn't think it was yeah. going to be popular at the time no, I, didn't, I didn't think it would go yeah nobody did i mean it's really you, you, i mean you never with a new band you, you no one's <laughs> no way I mean, you got to be nuts to be thinking, you know, that any, anywhere near what we did. Like, if you think <laughs> it's it, you're thinking too far ahead. If anybody's sitting in the studio going, "Man, we're gonna fucking sell 17 million, bro," <laughs> there's just no way. Even in those times, just yeah. Like, what? So, is it kind of like a you numbers know, game? Like, you just want to do as many albums as you can, and then hope one of them b- blows up? Yeah. Well, in the moment when you're coming up, you know, like I was as a producer, you you, you just want to work in the industry at all yeah just to be a part of something that was signed to a label was huge for me i'm like whoa this is actually a record that's going to come out you know yeah even fail or not not fail at least i'm making you know 30 grand or something to do it it was just huge for me but i'm like wow man i'm a dude of never you know, i'm from a you know middle class family in louisiana my whole life i never had any money and so to see that and even though we get joe we didn't make shit loads cash like you would think like a rock star cash thing you know and so in this moment, I'm like getting to do things I really love to do for, for 20, 30 grand. I was like, man, this is, I feel like well, I've really made it now, you know? And you get royalties then, too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Fuck yeah. Well, there's, that's, yeah. I mean, that's how I've continued on. And, you know, that's how I retired and whatever. Yeah. I took a buyout, I took a buyout on royalties to do this, to sit in Florida and just chill. <laughs> yeah. You <laughs> sold it. some of the Godsmack you know? album or something to, huh? you sold some of the Godsmack album royalties, right? No, I, I sold off. 30 years of uh, Evanescence is two and oh. Slipknot's all over. Oh, and Slipknot. Okay. And I, my kids will get it back in 30 years. But I, I kept the Godsmack and Mudvayne, other side royalties. Okay. But I yeah. pay a bunch of taxes. I, you know, I was a fucking party animal for a good decade. So I <laughs> fell in a rut. But yeah. I swam back out, man. I'm all better now. Yeah, you were saying, I heard you saying that you, you took a break from booze and then you kind of had this like moment of clarity. You were like, oh, I should like get some yeah. money for this stuff. Yeah, I, I, you know, I me and my manager had talked about it, but that was before streaming was big. It really, it's all because of streaming. You know, before yeah. before Spotify and that shit took off, things looked pretty drab. You know, mm. it looked like it was the regular decline of paychecks like you would always see. And so 2015, I'm like, wow, if this decline keeps on going, I really got to figure something out from work. You know, I got I to gotta get back and kick some ass here. I'm going to run out of money and figure out what I'm going to do. And... Uh, and me and him talked about that and the money that we thought that we could get for it, it was way too low to do anything with, you know, it would it'd be ridiculous. So 2016, Spotify starts taking off and then 2017, 18 and 19, that, that we're looking at a you know, pay increase that happened. It was, it was substantial, man. I mean, it was like, wow, my paycheck had tripled on royalties within three years. And so that's and when I had enough clarity from not drinking for that couple of weeks, I was like, well, now one of what's worth, you know, and this conversation may be a different conversation than we had before. Mm-hmm. And so when I went and checked on that, it absolutely was. It was it was right right at what I needed to to get caught back up and get taxes paid. Yeah. So tell, tell me about that. Over. The royalties, though, because I've heard other artists say that uh, Spotify doesn't pay. And didn't, didn't the CEO of Spotify come out and say, uh, you know, if artists want to make money off Spotify, they need to produce more uh, music. And p- that pissed off a lot of musicians, I think. But you're saying it's actually pretty good. Is that because that is that because uh, it combines uh, YouTube and Sirius? Uh, 
yeah, combination. Well, it's streaming in general, streaming in general overall. Yeah. And so you like, if I look at a statement, it's going to have all that shit on there. Spotify. Which one pays the best of the, the, you Spotify the best? I don't really know. I'm, okay. Um, because it, it's hard. To, I don't understand the statements. Honestly, there's so many listings and so many different things, you know. Oh, sure. The only accountants really know the, what's the more heavyweight individual things. I would imagine it's pretty good, though. But see, but you have to have something that's, you know, got as many, like something that's smashing, like, you know, Slipknot or Evanescence. Those are huge bands. Oh, yeah. And it starts to pay. But I can't imagine you make a whole lot of money just on Spotify. If you're a band with an album that's on Spotify and you only, you know, yeah. you got a few million spins, you're not going to make any money. And is the producer credit more than the musician credit or the songwriting credit too? No, it's less. Mine is, is an overall. I get three and a half percent of overall total. Oh. But they get, they see, they get points like I get points, but they also get publishing writing oh. on top of that. So they, I mean, they made a shitload of fucking money. Oh, band wow. members, in a, if a band goes platinum or over, and they're they're holding. The band's going to get a certain amount of points anyway, right? They, yeah. Like, the record company gives them like here's your twelve points or something. They each go and they get two or three of themselves, um, which is almost equal to what I got. And then they all, on top of that, have all the songwriting publishing as well. So, if you're in a band, you go sell a million records, you stand to make a shitload of money. Oh, that's sure. awesome. And, yeah. I so mean, if you're the writers, you know. What I mean? Yeah. Are you? Are you? you, know, you Joe, I was only I was only responsible for Busy Bee, so that my publishing on that was nowhere near what you know sure. Klaus had gotten. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, are you going to be doing any producing any new albums coming up? Yeah, um, I gotta decide. You know, um, there's a few things on the table. I'm just, you know, it feels good to be in a position to say no. Honestly, yeah, <laughs> I don't really have that part. must be nice. And so, you know, and I'm looking at there's a few things that have come across. And I'm just, I'm not sure what I do with them, and it's I just don't feel one of them. I don't feel the songs on it at all, so I don't see why I go in there and start trying to battle it out in a world where. They're in a market too. It's it's just some it's a band out of I'm not gonna say, but okay. they might listen. <laughs> There's a few of them just like that, and okay. it's a little bit difficult to think that that just because you know to try to go. Who cares? When I go like ten grand to take all this time and go fly somewhere, and then you know and they, they're in a market that's so flooded. You know, there's a million bands that sound like that, and it, it I don't if, unless I hear a song that's gonna blow me away. I don't know if I'm really gonna jump in into bed with the whole production thing well yeah so one of the albums you did for godsmack um it has that song uh crying like a bitch which is one of my favorite yeah. godsmack songs Can really? you... no way. Oh, i love that song yeah and uh now you got to tell me like do you know because you were in the studio so do you know yeah. who that song is about because the rumor is it was either uh vince neal or i think you're the drummer shannon i think he was kind of kidding he said it was about philip rivers because but that's because he's a raiders fan so is can you yeah, is it just about, about like it's about Nikki Six, yeah, oh, big time, yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, Sully was in a full on like, like battling mode with him. They don't get along, you know. Probably still. Oh each other. shit! Yeah. I really thought it was about Vince Neil. He boxed it out with Nikki. No, he. I was saying it as a as a like a expression. He was ready to box it out with that dude, man. What did he do that was so bad? Uh, they some something had happened. Um, I don't know what it was, man. Honestly, but something happened. They talk, shit talking started somewhere. Yeah, because I heard during that record that, that he was, you know, and that was one of the, that song was aimed directly at him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because I know that uh, they did Crew Fest and they were on they toured and the only thing I could well, find. What yeah, the That's thing. What happened. Yeah, I could find was that they said they wouldn't let uh, Godsmack bring their families and friends on the side stage. You know, like you were saying earlier, you had the two bars uh, on the side. He said they couldn't bring their friends on the side stage because they thought they were going to like uh mob Motley Crue or something like that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, that is something went down. I, I, that's hard to remember now. so long ago, but yeah, it's about that dude for sure. That's all. Did you ever have any run-ins with, Mo I mean, you met Mo uh, Van Halen and Bon Jovi and all those, you never had any run-ins with Motley Crue? Yeah, sure. I, um, um, we, I met who, who did I meet? Well, Tommy, of course, we met a couple times. And then he had uh, somebody who, no, oh, oh, Viggy that was working uh, with Godsmack, knew Tommy real well and had toured with him. Uh, and so Viggy came and said, Yeah, Tommy wants you to come up to the house and check out the studio. Maybe you'll see if you want to work there at some point. He had a fucking rad studio in his house in Calabasas. So it was insane. It was really cool. So me and uh, the guitar, uh, who was it? No, me and somebody went. Some guys, no, me and my engineer rolled out there at Tommy's house and said hi to him and went and checked the studio out. It was insane. It was such a cool 
it was just a unique room. I've never seen it like it. Is that the house that he did on Cribs where he had like all the dancing girls and shit? And... I, it was like an atrium in the middle. It looked like a fucking jungle in the middle of his house. Or something. <laughs> it, was, it was badass, man. And then you go in the studio and it was the most innovative wiring. Like I would never have thought of all that shit. Like he had, you know, like a, like a whole fucking room, I guess. I, it's, it's hard to describe. So you walk in this hallway, but it's all amps. Mm -hmm. all, sorry, all cabinets that are already mic'd. It's all these cabinets, and they're all patched on patch base. Everything's patched on patch base. And then you go in the control room, and there's this fucking wall. In the heads, there's guitar heads that are all mounted in the, in the I think they're mounted on the wall or on shelves or something. Yeah. So yeah, there's fucking 10 or 12 of these amps. So, and they're all patched. So that you now can just take patches and play with them and how you want to go like this Bogner goes to that cabinet or this cabinet, you know, in endless array of guitar sounds, man. It was, it was incredible. Wow. I was like, wow, never would have thought of that idea, you know, completely insane. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, yeah, so it, it was, I was like, whoa, I've never, I would have never thought of doing that. Patching, yeah. patching so, guitar amps. That's where they're all accessible in a patch bag, which is really yeah. crazy. That's really cool. So it was around also this time with the second, I think it was the second Godsmack album you produced or the first where you decided to get back with Ugly Kid Joe and then you guys had the reunion. Did you just miss playing with those guys and stuff? I mean, because your producing career was kicking ass, so you didn't really yeah, need well, the money or well, anything. At first it, was, it was just a matter of, uh, well, I didn't get back. I didn't tour until 2017. That was just my 50th birthday. I wanted to go party. <coughs> it went, said, you know, and I saw them doing a thousand people in Paris and I was like, man, I got to get them. <clears throat> I want to go check it out and then party for my 50th birthday and then feel what it's like again. And then that lasted for three years, you know, two and a half years. And uh, I got addicted to doing it. And then I figured out I'm going to fuck my hearing up if I keep going. So, so did you not play on the stairway to hell EP then? Or that was, it was okay. my idea. Yeah. Uh, that's what I, I thought. Me and, Shana yeah. were, me and Shana were doing the live and inspired or no, 2012 would have been, yeah. Like at the end of one of the sessions or something, I told Shannon, I said, man, you know, why wouldn't we just, like, I'm a producer, you can just put something on iTunes for free, you know, and why wouldn't we just put some Ugly Kid Joe up there? Even if people miss Cats of the Cradle, they, they have misclicks in this world, you know, or if they put something below something. <laughs> I said, why don't we just it. put a song right below yeah. it? And yeah. People just miss it, they hit it. There you go. Still something. I said, well, it's just free money. I said, why wouldn't we make another record? And so that's how, then Stairway to Hell got started that way. And then it went, took it from there being, and he got the spark of wanting to tour again. So they toured five years before I ever got back in the band in 2017. Okay. So you just made, made the back. album and then you didn't tour with the. I didn't tour. No, I okay. continued working and, and was at home. I, I love that. That album though. Is so it's, it's, you brought the mascot back and the, yeah, the sound cool is like, I mean, you're just wearing your influences on your sleeve. It's like ACDC, Judas Priest. Yeah. And I just, even the, uh, what's the song called? Uh, Need Another Beer or something like that. I love that song. It's almost oh, yeah. like a country song, but it's so oh, yeah. good. This, we have a, this new record coming out is insane. We're, we just really? finished it today. Yeah, oh, it seriously? Oh, it's, it's crazy good. Yeah. When does really it come out? Great tunes on it. I don't know oh. when it's coming out, but it's, it's I, I consider it to be the greatest artwork we've ever done ever as a band. Is the mascot back? Uh, yeah, it's, it, but yes. so far, I mean, it's crazy. Really? It's just rad. Okay. I can't wait. Uh, is there any band that you uh, haven't, uh, that, cause you played with so many bands. Have you kind of these festivals and everything? And then whether you're producing credits, is there any band that you haven't worked with that you want to work with or you want to hang out with or party with or open for? Um, for work? Yeah. Well, of course there's a bunch of bands I love to work with. Hell that you haven't yet. That I haven't. Well, any kind of uh, anybody in the, in the, in that, genre or zone of what I do, you know, there's, a, you know, all the big metal bands really, I'd love, you know, Vince Sevenfold, Disturbed, Disturbed, I'd love to make a record with, you know, because I, you know, yeah. I've heard Dave, Dave Draymond really loved Evanescence Fallen. I mean, he got my engineer to go work with him. I met their guitarist randomly. I was, I was driving Uber and he got in the back seat and he goes like, yeah, I'm in a band. I was like, Oh really? What band? He's like disturbed. I'm like, what? And it was really him. It was Dan Dawn again. So Nicest guy, dude. So down to earth. Very cool. Um, Let's see if I can send you this artwork. You can't put it on the air, but let's see. no, no, no. We'll You'll have to say, can you send me like a, like a uh, advanced copy do if it. I don't play it? Yeah, I will. When we get it done. Fuck yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I can't get on. <laughs> I won't share it. Yeah. You can trust me. I'm i uh, I'm a very loyal fan, so I'm not going to screw over. It's called rad wings of destiny. You can see it right now. Okay. Oh my God. That is awesome. <laughs> There's so much shit going on in this picture. I can't even. Yeah. Wait till you look oh. at it all. It's incredible. 
Oh it's, my! It's my favorite artwork ever. Who who okay. does those artwork? It's always the same guy. I don't know. Uh, Moist Brennan was a guy. It was a skateboard artist. It was the first guy. Okay. Back in the day, but then now we moved into like this dude. I think has been sent stairway to help this guy. And he's oh. Brennan, you know? Yeah, that is freaking yeah. amazing. That's so bad. I love this like is, this one's so colorful. This one just looks like it's us. Man. Yes, you know, exactly. What is it? Can you describe the, the music at all? Like, is it what is it? Which album this does is, it sound it, like? This is going to freak people out because it's it's a lot more. This is really a rock and roll album. It's like there's so, songs that are mixed like a Stones record on there, you know, and it's we did a cover of Lola. That's fucking phenomenal. Really? Pink Lola. It's unbelievable. I think it's one of the best things we've done. One of the best vocal performances that Wits ever captured. We got Mark Dotson, the original producer of America's Least Wanted, to come back and produce for us too. Oh. We went in El Paso. So it's it's all this the culmination of all just good karma and vibes from from the past. And, and the songs are fantastic. Some of the best songwriting I think we've ever we've ever done. You know. That's awesome. But it doesn't sound like anything else we've ever done. It's way different. I mean, it's but it's in you know, a rock and roll way. Okay. And a friend of mine that has been around from day one, Mikey, you know, Mikey from Snot. Yeah. Mikey Dolan, you know, he fucking tripped on it. He was like, dude, this is incredible. This is so good for you guys. Is there like some metal songs in it too? Like the Whiplash Liquor and Madman? Bit, and... Not, not full on metal, but Klaus has one that's pretty, pretty rock metal. Okay. You know, but then I have my normal two on there that are, are pretty, pretty, well, not, you know, like my kind of a country kind of vibe, whatever. Yeah. So that, I read an interview when I was a kid, it must've been Metal Edge or Rip or one of those things. Yeah. And they were saying how Wit he co-writes the songs even though he doesn't play an instrument because he kind of like explains it to Klaus and then Klaus can like like play it on his guitar. Is that how it works? Uh, well, they, it's, it's become that now. That was okay. In the old days, it was just me and Klaus writing. That's it. We'd oh, okay. Them, and then he would sing them. You know, we'd write lyrics and music for each of our songs. But now we're co-writing a lot. And Witt has, he has a couple of songs where he did mouth riffs, which I translated for him. And he's got a couple. There's a song called Hey, Hey, Hey that's fucking radical, man. God, it's it's it's, it's, it's you know, stuff sounds like Trans Am rock, man, from the seventies. You know some of it. Okay. It's California style. It's just it's just a fucking cool record, man. And it's a full. It's, really it's not an EP. Music. It's a full like, album. A full record, eight song record, yeah. Okay. It's a rad album, man. God, oh, I can't I, wait. I love that. One. It's a really cool album. Okay. I just done. I'll I can't. I'll send you a copy of um, artwork up and everything. Yeah, I can't wait to hear. It. That's gonna be awesome. Um, yeah, I'm stoked on it. Yeah, we had a great time making it too really cool experience so you're gonna you're gonna try to keep producing some bands that, but you, you're saying you can kind of be more selective now yeah you know I'm, and i get stuck in you know because there's, there's an artist out in uh, california rita taylor this little girl's like 12 but it's so hard to decide what i would actually do with it and then you know and i, they, I don't want them to end up watching this podcast because i'm gonna i'm gonna do it but it's i drive myself nuts because I don't really know what direction to go with it because some because people have already been trying to produce her. She's gonna be on a show called La Brea that's gonna be on NBC coming up. So one of these little kids is a child actor, a really talented singer too. But it, for me, I'm like I'm stuck as to where I should go with it. Cause because the father wanted me to do it because I'm an, you know, I did have an SSA and they think that's the sound it should be, but they don't really know. But then yeah. there's people doing it pop and I'm you know I'm not I haven't done a whole lot of stuff. Like I can't just go out and make a post Malone song. You know, because I haven't really practiced at doing that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, so or would I've you want to do that kind of stuff? It. Huh? Would you want to do that kind of stuff even? Well, yeah, if I could. But the thing is, nobody's calling me to do that kind of stuff. And so I have a feeling if, if that they may be heading themselves in the wrong direction. Like, they think they want it to be like Evanescence. But the moment that I really put a rock band or something on it and, like, make it sound like that, that they're really going to want to be more like what they think, what they really should be. They should probably sound like Post Malone. Because that's her... You know, they tell me one thing, and then she says, "Well, here's all my favorite bands, and they're all like Post Malone and all this stuff." You know, right? Okay. So, in other words, point being, you know, this is one of those moments where it's like it's it's not clearly defined that my involvement would be something even worth doing. You know what I mean? It just could end up being a, a convoluted nightmare, and it would a lot of it have to do it for free. It's a spec deal. Uh -huh. So, but it could. Then, in the the backside of these deals are. Now, what if, you know, imagine she runs off and becomes fucking massive, you know, out of nowhere. And, and I let that go. Well, it but, seems like you've taken a lot of chances that have paid off, like joint dumping Sugar yeah. Tooth for Ugly Kid Joe. That worked out. And then becoming a oh, producer yeah. for all these bands. I mean, that worked out. So what's worth taking another chance, yeah. I guess? 
I know it, doesn't, it wouldn't hurt to do it. Yeah, it just it, it's so, it's almost like I'm getting old now. I just I look at it like, oh god, here we go. But I, you know, I think I'm gonna cut it down and just have them let me do one song. Yeah, let's just see what it sounds like first. You know what I mean? That's what I'm gonna do. That's very cool. Well. Oh, I was trying to think. Uh, you got any? Uh, you, you told some really good party stories on the other podcast. Do you have any other ones that are coming to mind right now? Like, what other bands oh, yeah, party hardier than uh, than Ugly Kid Joke? It seems like you guys are pretty wild. Well, there was something that didn't get told in that fucking. Oh really? Other podcast? What was it? Somebody reminded me too. I can't remember now. Shit. Def Leppard, Van Halen, Bon Jovi, Metallica, Poison. Oh, no. I mean, you guys have toured oh, with so I many places. One was where. Uh, Oh God! There was one of the Aussie tour. Yeah, I didn't say much oh. about the Aussie tour. Yeah. Was Aussie sober there. at this point though? I don't know, but it was had to do with Zach Wild. You know, fucking oh. with it. We were in the we were our first tour, so we we're fucking raging, man. And Ozzy and Ozzy got sick, canceled a tour. I'm sorry, he got sick and canceled like a show one night. I think we're in Baltimore or somewhere, and to fill in to do something. So Zach had gotten with the these two other guys, one roadie guy and another and the drummer or whatever. And they, they do a three piece and they kind of play Southern rock. So we go to the club where they're doing it at down in Baltimore <laughs> and it's packed, man. You know, there's gotta be a thousand people in this fucking place. And so crane goes back in the stage behind it. It's where the bathrooms are like back in the back area. It's like a stage, but you can walk back there and go to the bathroom. It's still public behind there. Yeah. And so crane gets back there and finds a fucking fire extinguisher. And so he lets it spray all back in the back area and people panic. The whole place clears out to zero. They think it's some kind of fucking fire, I guess. People start panicking because they can't see and breathe and they run out. And so oh, shit. Zach's playing. He's literally jamming on stage and the <laughs> fucking place clears out to zero right in his face. Oh, God. So he has no idea and he figures it out. And I'm the first one he sees out of the parking lot. So, God damn it. Well, you guys think it's a fucking joke, and he got me by the neck, dude. He's trying to pick me up on my throat. I'm like, wait up, man, wait. It wasn't me. I'm like, it was wet, dude. He's like, you fucking look, God, motherfucker. He's so <laughs> mad at, me, oh, at us, you know? And I was like, dude, that wasn't me, man. Yeah, Jesus. Oh, I know the other one, too, was, which, I shit you not, this, this had to be one of the scariest moments ever, where this is the bad thing that happened with Def Leppard. Oh. This is the story that didn't get told. This oh. This one's gnarly. So we go, before we ever get with Def Leppard, right? We, we're playing this festival in Canada. And no, no, sorry. No, no. It was uh, Rock and Marine in 94. It was a, probably the best concert the band's ever played, right? We were so big. It, it was Germany's 80,000 people. Wow. And they were throwing mud and it was this fun thing, you know? And so we get the next year, we're touring. Oh, that was 92. So the next year we're touring with Def Leppard in America. So we hit this Canadian show. And so it's raining outside. So Wit decides, let's do the mud thing too. He's like, yeah. All right, so you guys throw mud, you know? So they start bombarding the stage to, to the point of where it's out of control. Like we're getting bombarded by 80,000 people with mud. Jesus. So, and he does the ultimate no-no. He To, to make it stop, Wit goes, all right, now bomb them. And he points to the sound tent. And those fucking dudes panic, man. I saw those guys what the fuck? And they start trying to cover up all the equipment and they just got mowed down. Just... Oh shit. Does that fuck up the it. sound? So, <laughs> it ended up being like a $600 cleaning fee, but you can imagine what kind of trouble that shit is for us. And they did literally mow them down. Like, and so we're walking off stage. I remember Rick, the, the drummer standing outside. He, he looks over and look, looks at, looks at me and goes, fucking twit. <laughs> just so mad at us. Oh my God. yeah does that happen yeah. a lot because i think i heard a story about you guys i don't know if it was when you were in the band or it was roger but it was at a long island show you guys did like a free show and people started throwing bottles at like glass bottles at you guys like hit one hit klaus in the head and like knocked him out uh, no i was there yeah oh okay I, near, I got nearly missed by a bottle that was just being in the wrong kind of city i was up in long island some assholes that didn't like us you know yeah. it was only a club with about 300 people maybe less it was a small little club and out of nowhere, man, he's fucking the one I'm busted on Wit's on Wit's microphone. Thank God, right? It was about to hit him in the face and busted right in this right in front of him. The other one hit Klaus in the head, and the other one missed me. You know, they they threw them all at the same time, three bottles trying yeah. to get in front. Yeah, you know, so I was like, whoa, dude. I mean, that's yeah, that was that's the only time that ever happened out of all those concerts, so which is pretty cool. You know? Yeah, oh, well, that's good. Yeah, because that's that's some scary shit. Like now, it seems like they they only give you plastic bottles or cups or whatever. Oh yeah, 
Yeah. No, that's yeah, that's about as scary as it gets. Yeah, somebody being a total dick. You know. Do you ever get? Uh, do you ever get? Did you ever get mobbed by fans or, or whatever? I always see like video, even oh. like the smaller bands. You know, I mean, not smaller, but like Skid Row and stuff. They have those music videos, and they're just they're in Japan, and there's just mobs. I mean, it's like the Beatles. Like it's craziness. Yeah, that, yeah. The Japanese. The one time that we had gone, this band was. It was some of that going on for sure, you know, where you're like, whoa, like, they, they, you know, they're, they're really sycophant types, you know. Like yeah, how do you, uh, how do you guys handle that back in the day? Because now it's like everyone's like, they're making money off that. They're using the meet uh, and greets for pictures and stuff. Yeah. Do you guys do meet well, and greets back in the day or? Yeah, we, well, it helps. Yeah, you want to, I mean, the theory is that the more individuals that you can affect and sign things for, then that spreads and that is just, yeah. you know, marketing is all it really is. Right. But yeah, you got to sign things. You have, and, and a lot of times we would finish concerts and be shitless. Everybody, all up in there. See, you, you're on stage. You haven't had a drink yet. They're drunk as fuck. Ugh. Right. It's really, it, it can really disturb you as, as, a, as a, a musician to have to deal with that kind of energy. You have to get used to it. And you got to, you know, and everybody's breathing on you and you got to sign shit. And, you know, and, it, uh. and they're happy. You have to realize that they're stoked because they just had a great show and they want to talk to you. So, you know, it drives some people nuts, but, you know, we, I got used to it. I think everybody did eventually but it oh. wasn't you know we weren't that over the top rock stars so i mean we you know in other words we, were, we never really hit a moment of being headliners to where we were that kind of band you know we never hit that fame level as people think we did you know what i mean well Not did you ever just get recognized just like walking down the street though or anything oh uh, yeah a few times yeah oh uh, certainly went was the fame of the band but yeah there'll be you know fans and their fans you know they know you that's cool sure, you know if, People that'll stare at a magazine for an hour, you know, that, yeah. that kid's gonna go like there he is, or some guitar player kid, you know, they'll they'll pick you out. That's very cool. You know, very cool. Yeah. Uh well, I always like to end each episode with a charity. Do you have one that you work with or promote or that you I, I don't really know. I, I don't know. I didn't really think about it. Um I'm not sure. Yeah. Nothing? There's nothing that you a charity? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know any I'm not sure what what charities are i mean i know that they just i don't know what one i would I don't all right we'll what, we'll figure something out um and, and then yeah i mean obviously obviously you've done so many amazing things a tour with ugly kid joe you've toured with almost every band you produced so many amazing bands um so you I say know. you're just going to kind of more focus on that you're not going to tour are you going to do any live shows with ugly kid joe like maybe an appearance here or there or? yeah i might i might go show up and jam a song or two with them you know oh cool Cool. Depends, you know, they're somewhere i'm sure me and shannon will end up doing that if they play the states and they come around here me and shannon are here we'll probably play with them i would imagine okay cool yeah i, I definitely got to yeah. see you guys live i'll have maybe i'll have to drive up to would it be california where you, you're in florida though right so yeah me and shannon are in Fort Myers, yeah. yeah okay so if you guys do a florida show maybe i got to come up for that fuck yeah i mean yeah. We, they, i'm sure they will that'll probably be something in the future okay will be if they tour america they will do that where me and shannon will play with them here for sure they'll play here or they'll play somewhere okay cool well keep me posted thanks so much for doing this anything else you want to promote or yeah it's been a pleasure anything else you want to promote or uh talk about or uh the new album red wings of destiny it's coming what's the do you have a date for it i i don't i'll update you though for sure okay cool man thanks so much dave this is amazing yeah brother all right thank you thank you bye-bye bye So there you have it, Dave Fortman, guitarist from Ugly Kid Joe, producer for so many amazing bands. I'm excited to hear the new Ugly Kid Joe. I I hope that I can get like a sneak peek of that. Otherwise, uh, I'll hear it when you guys all hear it, which will hopefully be soon. And uh, I definitely want to check them out live. Uh, So definitely check out Ugly Kid Joe's back catalog. Look out for the new album. Check out all the things that Dave has produced. You can look them up on Wikipedia. He's got quite an extensive resume. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, uh, share it with a friend. Uh, Subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And thank you all for listening. And remember to shoot for the moon.